Go ahead. Okay, we're starting, guys. We have no speaker. We have no speaker yet. You wanted to do your announcements, didn't you? All right, if you want to do that, I guess. All right, I'd like to welcome all of you to the weekly meeting of the College of Complexes. All right, we have several policies here. And and several procedures. First of all, um, everybody has to pay a three hour tuition charge to help us defray our expenses. Second, the restaurant does not weigh on it for itself. The whole thing requested for over eating dinner, meals, or something else to engage in those things. We have one pool at a time. And, um, No personal tax. No personal tax. Thank you. Yes. All right. We are formatting the problem. First of all, we will have announcements. Charlie will read off the same moment um, the announcements of the upcoming program. Then we will have announcements of table letter for heavy interest. No speakers during our time announcements only. Then I will introduce the speaker for the evening and we'll talk about our yeah, we can't hear it all. We'll talk about the uh, talk about the for about an hour or so. And then afterwards, we'll then have questions and answers. This is by Jeopardy. Questions must be in that form. Then we will have the final civil portion of the time for speaker, and each of you may talk about whatever they want. Questions about the speaker, but you don't have to do that. We can't hear you. We're going to have to close this down at about 7.30. Uh -oh. Okay. Charlie? Go ahead with the announcements, Charlie. All right. Well, we're trying to get our speaker back on. I want to welcome everyone to meeting number 3,715 of the Allergy Complexes, the playground for people who think. As usual, I will give an advertisement. We have a Google email group and a meetup email group. Virtually no traffic on either of these. I highly recommend you take a minute and sign up for it uh, in order to know what Charlie, we can you'll, you'll be notified as to the upcoming uh, program for the week. Please, and I must ask during the presentation, for everyone attending by Zoom, please mute, put a red X right now over the microphone on the lower left. Also, will everyone in attendance at the restaurant please maintain your conversations, at least during the presentation, because it is picked up by the microphones. Please can curtail conversations during the presentation. All right, coming up on May 13th, uh, Marilyn from our satellite campus has got a wonderful presentation. I've heard it already once on economic democracy. Uh, that she says this is necessary, and their forces are draining off the wealth. So May thirteenth, eco democracy. On May twentieth, our own Jonathan, regular Jonathan, will be talking about putting public figures, elected officials, uh, arresting them, and char charging them with war crimes bringing them before tribunals, such as the International Criminal Court. He feels they have uh, misused their, their authority. So May 20th, we're talking about war crimes. On May 27th, another college regular, Mike Lehman, will, will be showing 100 photos he took 
of high-speed trains in Europe. So we're gonna have something like a travel log, always enjoyable, and a, a very important topic, transportation topic at this time and in innovation. Transitioning into June, June 3rd and 17th are presently open. If you'd like to speak, uh, please contact me with a title and a written copy of your presentation. On June the 10th, uh, Henry, Henrik Kowalski will be talking. He's an author, a blogger. He's written several articles, posting right now. He recommends he reads. And we're going to be looking at the Ukraine situation. So June the 10th, the topic will be the Ukraine. On June the 24th, we have an academic, an evolutionary biologist, uh, Dr. Guy McPherson, uh, who's been active, very active internationally on global warming issues. So this is a very important informative program I recommend to everyone. Uh, and lastly, we do maintain two archival sites. The college has two archival sites. One, of course, is our lecture library, dating back a decade, more than a decade, video recordings of presentations. And also we maintain a separate list, I call it, a free speech list of PowerPoints and films uh, as relevant to presentations at the college complexes. Those are all free and online. Uh, in July, we have five dates open. So if you'd like to speak and haven't done so before, again, please contact me with the title and a written description of your presentation. We'll take a look at it, see if you're ready to go. All right, Tim, that's it. Take it away. Is our uh, speaker back, Charlie? I go. Oh. All right, Charlie, you're going to have to wing it then. You're the communist, so go ahead and start your. Wait a minute, let's see if we can round up this guy. One second. Okay. I want to log back in. If he disappears, we should do an open mic. Not necessarily put it all on Mr. Paydock. We, know we could that. each do five or ten minutes if the man can't join us properly. Okay, well, we'll just a nomination. Understood, Adam. Thank you. Well, do you want me to try to contact him, or should we just proceed? Maybe we should just proceed. Well, if he logs back in, we can try. If you want to contact him, go ahead. All right, we're going to do an open mic then. Uh, Why don't we get with Adam then? All right, Adam, go ahead. All right, well, I just parked at Dapper's. I could come inside and do it if Charles would like to go first. But, um, yeah, let's do that. I'm thinking, when I think about May Day, and I'll just say this as a preamble because maybe we'll get lucky and get this dude back. I think what's interesting, and I don't know if he'll talk about this or not, is uh, looking at the Haymarket case from the 1880s, um, you know, always start at the source. I think it's a fascinating and tragic piece of Chicago history and American history and world history. Um, and it, there's been a lot of interesting stuff written about the defendants. Um, I, I think there's also been a lot of interesting work about the reporters who covered it, like uh, Henry Demarest Lloyd uh, and his family that talked about this. And um, they, there are uh, his articles. He'd written about this in the Chicago Tribune and was married to one of the Tribune owner's daughters and was kicked out of the Tribune for it, uh, but still maintained his career as a muckraking journalist and was sort of a pivotal figure there. The fact that they were able to get pardons from Governor Altgeld, that it was really the Chicago police leading the way in this catastrophe. I think it's an astounding historical case uh, for us to look at from all kinds of angles. I'm not in a position to read anything right now until I get out of the car. Um, but 
there you go. Your first mobile introduction for the College of Complexes. Uh, I'll just take a few minutes there and pass the baton. Maybe we can all talk more later, or maybe we'll get our featured speaker back. Uh, but I think that the, the Haymarket saga, especially, uh, you know, the sort of go, go to the, the sources, the original May Day, I think is the most interesting. Uh, as much as any of the legacy since, I know there's important protests every year in May. Don't get me wrong. To so become a worldwide icon. But this is, means extra to us, I think, as Chicago history, uh, as, as people of the Chicagoland area. Thank you kindly. Okay. Charlie, you want to go next? All right. One second here. I'll go. Uh, I got something. Okay. All right. Yourself, okay. So May Day is from uh, May 5th, uh, 1880, like Adam was talking about the protest. It was a protest for the eight hour day, by the way. And it was actually a small contingent, maybe 2000 people on May 5th. And um, so the bomb was thrown and they never found out who actually did it. Supposedly that's the story. And uh, so it was either the police who threw it or it was some anarchists. And anarchists were very popular in that time, 1880. Uh, not like today when the, I go to a, a Wobblies meeting and the, they used to have them on Montrose and five people would show up and Charlie would be there too. But, uh, and I was there at a couple of meetings. But anyway, so the Wobblies were very big. There were maybe 100,000 me members from around the United States of America at that time. And of course, May 1st was originally the original Labor Day in, in the United States, in this country. And of course, it's May Day is, is celebrated all across the world, R Russia, China, France, Germany, uh, South America, Chile, Honduras, Guatemala, Argentina, and uh, in the in the, I think it's in Asia too, with uh, Japan and Burma and Vietnam. But the only the only international country that doesn't celebrate it is the one where it happened, which is very ironic. The one in, in Chicago, Illinois, in the United States, they don't celebrate it because they changed it after World War II to make Labor Day the first Monday in September. And uh, that's that story. So actually there's a, uh, there's a monument in the Forest Park Cemetery outside Chicago. If you go to the west side next to Oak Park and go to Forest Park where supposedly more dead people live than live people. There are a lot of cemeteries in Forest Park. And there is um, Emma Goldman's cemetery where she's buried. She's buried in Forest Park and there's a monument to the uh, anarchists who were killed, were hung, the five that were hung and the three that eventually, like Adam said, they were pardoned by the governor. Anyways, um, that's about all I got. Thanks. Okay. I'm going to go myself. I'll help go myself. Yeah. To me, May Day was one of the biggest hijacked holidays in the world. Who hijacked it? It was the Communist Party, the Bolsheviks. They come in and have a quick. Uh, a little bit of them. Um, they came in and they said, oh yeah, it's all for the worker. It's all for us. What they really meant was they wanted state control of the capital, which is basically monopoly power, which is basically why you have all the atrocities in a dictatorship rather than letting a free market come in. And I'm talking about a free market here, not the type of stuff we had today with the some of the Koch brothers of large corporations getting away with us in a deregulated environment. 
I just had the, the recent, I started doing a little research that uh, Ellen Corley kind of got me on a little bit. And some, and some of the books and movements of the uh, Koch brothers and some of the rise of the, uh, from the libertarian and conservative of the philosophy of limited government and uh, things like this. And there's a lot to be said because these guys, the biggest reasons they were for limited government was so that they would have relations. And the reason they did that was because they wanted to keep their copier state done. The tax rates and the tax code was set up for philanthropic organizations where after 20 years, they could keep their inherited wealth. I find it absolutely amazing that, uh, you know, although I do support a free market, I don't like fraud. I don't like uh, companies committing fraud and that includes wage theft. But again, you know, you can be with a free press, you can hold them accountable. With the government regulation, the antitrust laws, you can keep things going. So I still think our system is better than the communist system where you don't have dissent, you don't have everything else. And besides, the only way those countries keep going is through corruption in an underground marketplace in the first place. So anyway, whether you're gonna be these glories of communism and say, oh yeah, we're gonna have socialism, I'm all for some form of government aid to uh, people and, and to get some help in there. And sometimes even in, in business, when you need an incentive to get things moving, like with some of the uh, solar panels, I, I hate women to say that. I used to think the market would do everything, but you know, it's it's one thing when you start learning a little bit more about things. All right, I'm going to let our next person go. Adam's back in here, so Adam, you want to. You're laughing a little bit. You're more than welcome to. All right. Uh, I can go. I can go, Tim. All right. I'll go Charlie and said. Yeah. All right, Charlie, go ahead. All right. Now, for many, many years at the College of Complexes, we used to do a reading of a play written by one of our regulars, Burr McClowski. Bur McClowski had the distinction of being at the college from almost its inception, and he attended for 50 years, uh, at least once a year for 50 years. And he did enormous amount of research into locating original documents and wrote a play. Unfortunately, the play is so long that once we tried reading it, it took hours and hours. We were at something like five hours and still reading. So it, I abridged it and we used to do an abridged version reenactment of the Haymarket market situation. Now a significant number of books have been written about the Haymarket, particularly of interest to here in Chicago. What happened in 1886 was that there was a movement in the United States to get the eight hour work day. Eight hours work, eight hours rest, um, eight hours for what you will, they used to say. It was a nationwide movement. They had various organizations such as the Knights of Labor operating at the time. Uh, also the AFL-CIO was started that year. Um, so organized labor really didn't exist. Now in Chicago, they had individuals who were identified as anarchists. That's, that's, there's a clarification most people do not understand. Anarchists are not opposed to government. They are opposed to a government that takes the side of the employees or workers over the capitalists and bosses and managers and CEOs. So they were opposed at the time. Um, uh, yes, labor, organized labor was interpreted for it seems like the Supreme Court as a criminal conspiracy, a crime. It was considered restraint of trade. You were interfering with commerce. And therefore, they could invoke injunctions. And they were authorized, therefore, to send police if you tried to 
uh, engage in collective bargaining, such as a picket line, uh, to dispense any such activities. So it was a formative period in, in, at the time. Um, what they actually did was have a parade in Chicago for the eight hour day on May Day. And I believe they had significant attendance, something like 100,000 people participated. As it turns out, there was a labor action in progress at the time. Uh, McCormick Works, uh, Chicago was beginning to be a manufacturing center and the McCormick Tractor Works and agricultural appliances were being made here. Um, and as a result of that, there were counter protests planned for actually May the 4th, which is when the Haymarket Affair took place. Now they had speeches. The location was actually near the loop at Halsted and Des Plaines, relatively close. The, the, that is a produce type market. Uh, and it almost still is to this extent, though that area has changed. But at that location, they basically had a protest and at the site uh, to voice opposition to what had taken place in regarding this McCormick activity. During the course of the event, uh, it, it actually didn't turn out to be much of an event. And as a matter of fact, it looked like it was going to rain. The mayor of Chicago, in fact, was in attendance. And somewhere along the line, they're about to close. Um, and a bomb was thrown. And it's correct, it's never been ascertained who threw the bomb. Um, but nevertheless, half a dozen so-called anarchists were identified, a number of which who were not even present at the event. And there was something of a, if you want to call it a trial, it was a ridiculous event. Um, anyhow, four people were hung ultimately. Uh, one cheated the bank and took his own life with his group was said with a stick of dynamite. Um, the play that was written, and I have a copy of it. We may do it again sometime. And if anybody would like a copy of the abridgment, at least, it's called uh, Cell 29, which was the cell occupied uh, by one of the alleged. Now, depending on who you are, if you're a capitalist, you call them rioters. If you're a, a socialist or a labor person, you refer to them as martyrs. Uh, there is a monument in a near in the cemetery in the near west side, and there is an annual gathering there um, uh, annually on May Day with speeches and so forth, marking the occasion. It is maintained by the Illinois Labor History Society. Now, as a postscript to this, one of the um, you know, martyrs uh, was Lucy, her wife, uh, his wife was Lucy Parsons, Albert Parsons and wife Lucy Parsons. And she was a presence around Chicago afterwards, an activist, so the literature, mad tables and so forth. But Lucy Parsons was an outspoken activist for the organized labor movement during the early part of the 20th century around the city of Chicago, where she resided. I actually put together an effort and had speakers and so forth. And the Chicago Park District was looking to name parks and they were looking to name women. Uh, a park named after women and I submitted the name of Lucy Parsons. I, this action was opposed by the Chicago Police Association. They did not think that she should be honored. Nevertheless, um, my 
side of the issue prevailed. And you can go visit the park today, Lucy Parsons Park. Uh, the other thing that subsequent to the uh, Haymarket affair was that um, the headquarters of any sort of organized labor activity was raided. The unions, in effect, did not exist within the confines of the city of Chicago. Um, later on, this transpired for a period of time. And in 1905, in Chicago, in defiance of the law <coughs> and the authorities, a number of activists got together, which included Mother Mary Jones, Big Bill Haywood, and a few others. And they started an organization called the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, which exists today and to which I am a member. Um, I was at a meeting, as a matter of fact, yesterday or the day before, an organizing meeting. Now, the IWW was the first one to uh, uh, organize in defiance of the law. Now, as it turns out, it took, you can imagine, I, I don't place much term in terms of labor laws because it wasn't until the 1930s that we were able to pass the Fair Labor Standards Act. I believe it was 1938, to be precise. So you can see how difficult it is uh, to establish labor laws that are favorable to working individuals. It is said among uh, labor educators, and they, they will in total agreement on this, that the United States at present treats its employees worse than any other country. And we probably operate under the most uh, disadvantageous labor laws. I even give a lecture which demonstrates this in the fact I have that labor unions, personally, my views under the current laws, are in fact against the law. They're written so tightly that they are unable to operate. Now, there are bright occasions such as the passage recently in the state of Illinois of the amended the constitution that we will not have this uh, nefarious free choice kind of uh, situation ever existing passed by the Illinois General Assembly. And I thank everyone who voted for that. Um, so that's basically it. Now regarding communism and so forth, I don't know if we ever get our speaker back on, but I'd like to say two things in general. First of all, if there's anyone who's a socialist or communist, it's generally regarded that somehow they are deficient in logic, knowledge of history, and possibly have been brainwashed or tricked into taking that political position are advocating for socialism and communism, which to my mind are essentially the same progressive, we're talking about progressive politics. Uh, the other thing is, um, you know, we, we did have a period of time uh, that the, there was a concerted effort. I also like that, starting in 1917, there's been a concerted effort by the manufacturing forces in the United States to discourage and disdain and disparage any sort of socialist or communist thought from entering our minds. This is an active campaign at some degree of success in the 50s. Um, and uh, yes, <laughs> Uh, when you took a job in many locations, they would often ask you, have you been, ever been a member of uh, such organizations? And that would deter you from getting it. So it was an effect. They even went so far 
as to limit the immigration of people from Eastern Europe uh, because they believe they might be bringing, uh, they might be an influx of these socialist or communist ideas into the United States. And I'll finally, I'll end it with one thing about Tim, thing there about so forth. It's often told to me that <coughs> communism does not work. Now, in various positions, I say, I think to myself, well, where, where has it been tried? In various countries, to various extent. Um, I don't know how you measure success or failure. I guess if you're someone who's oppressed, it's very successful. If you're of the capitalist class, it's a failure. And we have a multitude of countries. Um, there is a distinction. Some people think that this can only be implemented to revolution, while others think you can do so in a legislative fashion by passing appropriate legislation. Um, the, the thing is, when I hear that capitalism does the work, people fail to ask the question, does, does wait a minute, does communism doesn't work? And I ask, does capitalism work? I don't think you could find a company anywhere, hardly a few, that are 100 years old. Most businesses fail within the first year, isn't it? Something like a strong figures of 50% or higher don't exist a year later. Now, what happens to the people who are employed in these operations? And to tell me that capitalism works, also there's been a session and recessions uh, there's been dozens of, uh, of recessions or depressions in the history of the United States. I think there's been like 17. So to tell me that this system works is not substantiated by any of the data. So give it up. It doesn't work. It doesn't work for the owners. It doesn't work for the consumer. And it doesn't work for the people involved in it. Okay, Charlie. Tell you all around. All right, that's about it. All right. Turn it over to somebody else. All right, Sid. Now give him, give him the black one. Sid, talk loud. Give him the black microphone. Does he have that one right there? Give it to Sid. Sid, you can sit right there. Sid, you can sit right there. And, uh, Go ahead and uh, make your rebuttal. Look at the camera, Sid. Right, right behind you, behind you. Behind you. Yeah, see it, Sid? Okay, Sid. Um, let's keep it, keep it loud, Sid. The idea of the uh, mayday and the uh, this was on all Sid about two blocks north of Madison Avenue, Madison Street. Use that's the microphone, where, please. That's where A Market Square was. And the idea was, and somebody else brought this out, that we should have eight hours for eight hours to sleep, and eight hours recreation. That was the idea. So, Somebody else brought it out that somebody threw a bomb and not too many people actually showed up for it. And um, what it was, if you look into history, not only into Chicago, but in all parts of the United States and Europe, and probably in Asia too. For instance, they had a pamphlet put out by Carson Ferry Stockton. And what it was, you were six days a week. And you came very early in the morning and you and you set the stove and you cleaned up around your place of work and you were from 
early morning until dusk set in, maybe seven, eight o'clock at night. Very long hours. And the conditions were horrible. If you wanted to get off on Sundays, what you did is, is go to your, your church or whatever you belong to and get a written statement that you came there on Sunday so you could have Sunday off. And that was the conditions that people worked under. It was actually more a form of out and out slavery than anything else. And if we look at the idea that communism is not is not something that came out of primitive people like the American Indians lived under primitive communism. There was no capitalism here. And when the commun when the uh, Indians first met Columbus and, uh, in the Caribbean, they treated them very well. And they didn't try to harm them. What happened was that the Europeans tried to push them into slavery and they rebelled. And some of them committed suicide because they couldn't stand the work that were given to them. Under their system of primitive communism, they didn't work long hours. They worked until they had enough to eat and were comfortable, and that was it. It was like going backwards. So the idea that communism is not indigenous in the United States and Canada and Europe is, is a hoax. It's phony. All people who lived under that type of system, even the Roman Empire was nothing but a bunch of tribes a hundred tribes getting together on the seven hills of Rome and 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 making and pulling into civilization with slavery. And every time people rebelled against it, the police came out against them and killed them and things of that nature. There was a big there was a revolution in Rome by Spartacus. Spartacus came from Thrace, which was a part of uh, Greece. And anybody that was captured in war under, under Roman Empire would become slaves. And if you do want to become a slave, you try to run away, either kill you or make you do even worse work than before. So actually, is indigenous to all people of the world, but you don't hear that history because they don't want you to know about it. Okay, you want to go next? Let me for president. Yeah. I'll go. I guess okay, I'll I'll go. Ellen, go ahead. We'll get you right up there. And, uh... okay. All right. Let me get you back on camera there, Ellen. And we'll be all set. We got you up there. Go ahead and you the floor is yours, Ellen. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, I actually, you know, coming to learn more about Bay and workers' rights and the labor movement and Marx, largely from Sid here. Uh, Sid is a Marxist, a genuine Marxist philosopher. That's why I pick him up and bring him here. Uh, 96 years old. Um, there's, he's got 95. Okay, so <laughs> he's got a lot to teach us. And, um, but it, it's interesting because it's genuinely from, from his experience. And uh, I think that's how we learn, right? That I was, I was originally a, a Kennedy kid, um, you know, 
know, so a lot of people will distinguish themselves, you know, are you Marxist, are you liberal? And it's confusing. Chris Head just says he's not a Marxist. He's, uh, what is he? Um, I, I think he said maybe an anarchist or a social Democrat. And um, I, we all have to figure out what we are. Um, you know, it's kind of like what religion you are or what values you have. But one thing, uh, more and more, I believe we need to stop the war on communism. I'm anti-fascist, anti-imperialist, anti-tyrant, tyranny, um, and anti-corruption, because I see what we're living in is a stage of corrupt, invisible fascism, imperialism. And but you only know this by um, by seeking out this covered up form of history, the untold history of the United States and empire. Howard Zinn has a great book, The Untold uh, Story of American Empire. Um, I learned last night watching a story, what really happened in Iran and uh, the students' revolution. But, and, you know, it's like you're afraid here to say I'm a revolutionary because there is a secret police crackdown on everybody who's like that. But, yeah. It's invisible here, and we're indoctrinated to think that we've got freedom and there's a free market and we're the exceptional people. But the more you look at the genocides of, I, I look at the Sabak in Iran that you see in this documentary, it's on CBS, uh, the hidden, taken hostage is the name of it. And to see how America you know, went in and overthrew Mossadegh. This nice man uh, acted like we were his friends and you know, Roosevelt, Kermit Roosevelt acted like, this is in like, the 50s, I think, and he acted like, you know, this was a great victory for the CIA and he'd do it again. And, you know, this is the problem of our CIA is really like the, we go in and put like the Sabak or the Gestapo or into countries. It's, it's dirty wars that every one you look at, America was behind it. And that's exactly actually what happened in from the that I know about the Haymarket riot was actually it's interesting. Luke, you know, Luke, my cousin, his brother-in-law's family said, Oh, that was our grandfather, was the policeman at the Haymarket riot. So, you know, we should be able to go back and see, okay, uh, see that the police did the bomb. I mean, this is how our police are. We crack down on communism. We are a population control thing. They're not there to serve and protect us. That's a dirty war. It's been going on for years. That's why, uh, you know, what is it? Power to the people. <laughs> You know, question everything. But we need to have a, a peaceful revolution. Gandhi and Kennedy and, um, you know, what they've done is lie about the good people. And our job, we need to have the media that can, um, they can break down um, the lies and bring the good people back. Okay, thank you. Hi. Okay, who wants to speak next? No, oh, you coming? Yeah, we're just... Person never came, so you want to give a talk about it? Go ahead. Speak up on Marxism if you want. You want to speak up on Marxism? We've got an open mic here. It's kind of an open mic. Yeah. So uh, go ahead and we'll give you a few minutes to so go ahead and, and say your thoughts there, sir. Well, uh, I'm not a piano, but I, I had uh, the privilege of being born with two national identities. First, I was born in Houston. Louder. Federal Frank Young. She followed 1905. French from the first time in She followed 1881. And we're now at the age of 85. I want to Congress again. Hey! Hey! A little louder, please. A little louder. 
Let him speak up a little bit. Pick up, no, pick up the other microphone. 1974. Okay, the other mic. 11th Congressional District. Okay, after, after, after you're done our speakers finally here. Go ahead, they'll finish. No, no, keep going for a little while. First commissioner's back, but we'll... Uh, I got over 8,000 votes. That was a one-man campaign, but I got good coverage in the newspapers. And so I I scared the Democratic Party, and they tried to bribe me not to run again. And they were so scared. They said, listen, we'll give you, I know you're a young lawyer, we'll give you a, a signature. You know what that is? I mean, you get a salary, but you don't have to work. I can make 35, 40,000 a year. And you say, pick what you Law department you want to work for a state's attorney corporation, down of Chicago or Chicago Transit Authority. I said to the man that was sent from downtown, fifth floor, okay. City Hall. I said to him, I'm going to be right. I'm going to take a hemlock. I'm not going to accept the bribe, not the one again. I don't even plan the one, but, but it's against my principles. We were in a salary. No, no, no. And then after that, they forgot about me. I forgot about them. 50 years later, I see our country descending to such a sad state of affairs. I say, I got to run again. Run, run, run. Not, but that's not for me because I'm 85. I got no future. I'm doing it for the younger people like you guys and other generations behind us because they deserve to live in a country that the founding fathers, those perfidious Englishmen who betrayed what was then the greatest country, the most famous country in the world. They betrayed it in order to be able to continue to bring slaves from Africa, falsely claiming that they were doing it to liberate the colonies. And if you don't believe it, read the book by Professor Gerald Horn about 10 years ago, the counter revolution of 1776. So then after that, they went to make a constitution. That constitution, by it was done by the medication and malice of force, though. It was supposed to be functional for the top 10%, property owners, slave owners, merchants, people like that, but dysfunctional for the bottom 90%. And that's why we got all these problems. Now, the biggest tragedy for us is that those perfidious founding fathers won the revolution. If they had lost the revolution, we would be living in a more civilized country like England, like Canada, I think there's three countries, Atlanta, in the, all right. uh, Australia. So those people have more human rights than we have here. They live in a healthier, safer, and more civilized society. So that's what I hope America will become one of these days, and that's what my campaign is about. Okay. Okay, our main speaker, Fred Kushner, has now come back to join us. He's going to be joining us audio only. I still assume he has some trouble. So, Fred, uh, the floor is yours. Tell us about May Day. Okay. All right, so um, good afternoon, fellow wage slaves. Happy May Day week, the day of the international working class. This week, millions of workers and people who believe in the international working class took to the streets at celebrations all over the globe. On May Day in Israel, there was a demonstration of 150,000 of Arab and Jews, working class people who said no to imperialism, to Zionism, 
to anti-Semitism. And were many of them either communists or people who thought we needed equality. Now, as a fellow Chicagoan who lives in California, May Day is very precious. I went to my first May Day when I was in 1948. My communist mom pushed me in a stroller. I think it was in Humboldt Park. We lived in Humboldt Park during most of the McCarthy period till we were thrown out of there because of the FBI. So I've been going to May Day, I'm now 77, many, many years in many, many places. Chicago, New York, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, Santa Ana, in California, Philippines for dinner. And each of these May Days were different. And of course, most of us know that Labor Day is not the international working class holiday. May Day is. The bosses came up with Labor Day to counteract May Day. And May Day was kicked off. The spark was a uh, rally on Des Plaines and Randolph. There's a statue there by uh, anarchists, communists, socialists, and their families. And they're mainly immigrants. Actually, the call to the meeting by August 5 was in English and German. A lot of the organizers were the older ones had actually come to the United States of, after 1848, the revolutions, which inspired Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels to write the Communist Manifesto. There were revolutions all over Europe in 1848. And then in 1871, there was a Paris Commune where the workers of Paris set up an equalitarian state and fought the Prussians and the royalists and the republicans who all united against the workers of Paris. And they held out for months and had the first working class equalitarian state for a short period. So we move right along. After the Civil War, where many of these same workers from Germany fought against slavery. And of course, we know the reason why that war was won by because thousands of black workers joined the Union Army. It was because of that that Grant was able to defeat Grant Lee. He wasn't a great military genius, but the dedication and the blood and sweat of black workers who wanted to be free from slavery ended the Civil War and victory. But of course, after the war, it was the same shit for working class people. And by 1877, there was a wave of strikes, and particularly the railroad strike that shut out railroads everywhere, which is where the Sarah of Eugene Debs career started. He was the, one of the founders of the uh, American Railroad U Workers Union. And they shut it down, of course, the Democrats 
and the Republicans all united and got the courts from our wonderful Supreme Court, known as the capitalist court, the boss's court, came down with injunctions and the army killed many workers. So we get closer to 1886 and the country's in a terrible state. Workers are, are starving. And the workers at McCormick, which uh, McCormick works, tractor works, were making a lot of money. Just so happens they also own the Chicago Tribune, the McCormick family. So when that strike kept on getting more and more momentum, the ruling class of Chicago was scared shitless. So they kept on arresting people. So the rally on May Day was a rally to build support and solidarity. And of course, there were women and children and their families were there. A bomb was thrown. Workers were killed. And some cops were killed too. And of course, even people who weren't at the rally who were leaders, like, uh, if I remember, Parsons wasn't even there. Our spies wasn't even there. They were rounded up and they were accused of being the ones who caused this. It was probably done by a provocator or with somebody, a boss's agent, and he threw it badly and he killed some cops by mistake. But as a result, there was a wave of fascist terror in Chicago against immigrants, against workers. But this is already part of the Knights of Labor and um, other groups had already put forward the eight hour day as a fight. And the first international, founded by Karl Marx, Engels, and some, had already said, we need the eight hour day. People were working six, eight hours, I mean, seven days, there was child labor, a little more than 140 years ago. By the way, they tried to bring back child labor. Capitalism is a great, they keep on trying to figure out the way of grinding this down. So as part of the fight for the eight hour day and to stop the legal lynching of the Haymarket martyrs, May Day was established. By the way, in Waldheim Cemetery is the, a beautiful statue of the Haymarket martyrs, some who were legally hanged, lynched, thrown in jail, and later exonerated by Peter Alko. And of course, he was never allowed to be governor again after that. And that's how May Day started. But every time I'm in Chicago, I go to Walheim. I look at the statue of the Haymarket Martyrs, of Chicagoans who established the international holiday. You are so lucky to live in Chicago. Home headquarters of the international workers of the world burial site of Elizabeth Carly Flynn, the original rebel girl whom my sister was named after. A woman by the name of Sylvia Woods, who was a black worker from Louisiana, is buried there, who went to church and communist meetings, took us to Emmett Till's um, wake, when I was a child, was the first black uh, union store. My dad happened to be the United Electrical Workers uh, organizer for that before he went work full time for the Communist Party. So I grew up as a communist 
and I always saw May Day as a communist holiday. But also, I I know a lot of different people march on May Day, immigration, all kinds. But to me, it's always a day of accounting for the international working class, where you see red flags for people chanting for revolution. And I just want to share with you a couple of May Days, and then I'll shut up, and we could talk about other stuff. In uh, 1971 was the first May Day in recent memory that was a march for workers' power, for the dictatorship of proletariat. The party I then belonged to called the Progressive Labor Party, which had been a Maoist party, had an openly communist May Day of thousands in Washington, D.C freaked the ruling class in D.C. out. In, I should also say we should also pay homage to the populace who had multiracial unity in the 1880s, 1990s, and to uh, reconstruction where black workers took over the governments and established free education and voting rights and health care with white allies. So May Day is all part of that tradition. In 1979 in Chicago, I was a member of something called the International Committee Against Racism. And the Nazi party had a headquarters on Western and 71st in Marquette Park. And we had a series of demonstrations and actually invaded and beat the shit out of them. And when they pulled out their guns, we took them away from them and got their way before the Klan and Blue, the cops, got there to protect them. And then we had a May Day march into Marquette Park itself as a culmination of showing what punks the Nazis were, and what assholes they were, and that multiracial unity would always defeat. And the slogan, Hitler rose, Hitler fell, we're going to fuck you up good this time. And we marched over 2,000 to Market Park and defended ourselves against hundreds of racists who tried to attack our mark and dignified marched out and we gave as good as we got. In the period of May Day, also in 1979, we had a summer project in Tupelo, Mississippi, where the Klan attacked us. And one of our black comrades broke the back of a Klansman who wanted to shoot. Of course, say Mississippi couldn't allow a black man who actually was a professor from Chicago State, but was a strong anti-racist, multi-racial unity guy. They tried to frame him on murder, but the workers of Mississippi and a lot of the people rallied to him and they had a back down. And I'd like to make a, one other May Day memory. We, uh, in 1983, the Klan started trying to organize in that same area again. And we attacked them pulled them off their truck for beating the shit out of them till the cops came and defended them. I've never seen so many fucking cops in my life coming to defend the Klan. That's why we call them the Klan in blue. So, and then in 1992, we had a May Day March in, Chicago, in LA during the Rodney King Rebellion and where they were calling it a riot. It was a rebellion against racism, against 
the terrible conditions for black and brown workers in LA. And we had a march in defiance of their ban. And of course, again, the cops attacked and we defended ourselves and they threatened to throw people in jail. So the old slogan of the miners is, sends guns, money, and lawyers is always true. Because it always takes money and capitalism. And the miners in, in the coal fields of Illinois, Kentucky, West Virginia, and the blacks in the civil rights movement, the deacons of self-defense in Louisiana, always believed that workers had a right to defend themselves. And eventually we're gonna take power, the international working class. And May Day will be everywhere. And it will be every day, the day of the international working class. And the bosses and their lousy, rotten, climate killing system will be history. And we will be the victory, victors, and we'll write the history, the truth. The truth is there's two classes. There's a class destruction of racism, of hatred. And then there's class, the international working class that produces all the goods and services, that produces the most wonderful people who treat people of all colors like family. Not every of them, not most of them every day, but we see more and more. Our day is coming. Each day is large, day is larger. More and more people hate capitalism, hate imperialism, hate wars like the one in Ukraine and understand that one day, like in 1917, the army, the Navy, the Coast Guard, the working class will turn their guns around and there will be a new day of freedom for our class. And that's my May Day talk. Any questions you might have, I'll be glad to try and answer. Tim, you're muted. I get muted like I forgot to unmute. All right, my, sister, my question to you is, Fred, if your system of communism is so good, how come the people of the former Soviet Union threw it off in uh, 1991? Second of all, why is it that uh, the Ukrainians are fighting for a capitalistic system now? And why is it that uh, if it is so good, um, why aren't you there? Okay, um, yeah. all right, so somewhere along the line, long line, something went wrong. And people like to talk about authoritarianism, etc., and about uh, uh, different, you know, Stalin was crazy. Uh, uh, Trotsky was a god, uh, capitalism, uh, we're all innately selfish, blah, blah, blah. And 
people who are communists like myself said, well, what, 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 what was the problem? So I don't think the role of the individual is the absolute answer. In other words, there are people who say Stalin was paranoid and he actually was a monster, etc. I think the workers controlled imperfectly the Soviet Union, and many, many people loved it. You should listen to people like W.E. Du Bois, Paul Robeson, the Ruther brothers who founded the UAW, talk about their experiences in the Soviet Union. It was the only country that had full employment. People went to the Soviet Union to get jobs during the depths of the depression. There were a lot of mistakes made. There were a lot of people who were two-faced, who were charlatans. There were revolutions made by people of all types and people get disillusioned and they get cynical. But basically the, the working class controlled and they controlled the Communist Party. Not everywhere the way they should. But if you look at the workers of Stalingrad, for instance, in 1943, workers in Stalingrad in the famous tractor factory built tractors during the day while they were surrounded by the Romanian and hit the right German forces. Although there were always a couple German communists who would sneak and cross the line and give them intelligence about what was going on. And as they were encircled and being starved, they would go out at night in raids to push back the Nazis to smash the Romanians to wait for the truth to come to defeat the Nazis. Many of them knew they were going to die. But they did it for two reasons. For Mother Russia, but many of them did it for communism. And some of them for a mixture of that. Because the Soviet Union epitomized what Russia was to them, to the world. What we found out during the post-Stalin era, looking at, and much of this is coming from the critique of the Red Guards in the Cultural Revolution, where they said, the problem is that we, we, we need equality. If you belong to the Communist Party, you shouldn't get a better job. You shouldn't get better food. We need from each according to their need, from each according to their ability. And under socialism, the solution was, oh, we'll give to each according to their work. But that's an equality. So you could be a Stalkanovite and work and work and work, and you would have a better apartment than somebody else. And the privilege became more and more, and it rotted out the system. It killed working class unity. But Stalin is still loved in the Soviet Union, by, by excuse me, in Russia by many, many people. He's still, Putin is a piece of shit, but he knows that if he drapes himself in what happened during World War II, he can cover his crimes. Just like the US ruling class covers its crimes with the brave sacrifices of workers.
Okay, Fred, we got another question. Charlie, go ahead. Yeah, Fred, your father and mother were both member, active members of the Communist Party in the middle part of the 20th century. Did they experience any difficulties as a result of their affiliation? Uh, one more time about what my, uh, uh, about my Did dad. your parents experience any difficulties as a result of their membership in the Communist Party? Oh yeah, my dad was underground for four years. You gotta remember that uh, in 1940, for instance, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was thrown out of the uh, American Civil Liberties Union, which she helped, helped found because she was a communist. And there was something called the House on American Activities Committee. And Truman in 1947 instituted a loyalty oath for everybody. And there was a, something called the Smith Act that made it illegal to be a communist in this country. So Elizabeth Gurley Finn went to jail in 1951. My dad, many communist leaders either went to jail or went underground. And my dad was like a second or third level leader. And they sent some of them, they kept some people above ground, some went to jail, some went underground. So I didn't see my dad for around three years during the McCarthy period. And even though my dad was a minor, it wasn't a big diet, big deal. My mom brought in a woman named Medora's Fine, whose husband, Fred Fine, was in the Politburo, like the seven top people in the Communist Party. So the FBI wanted Fred real bad. So the FBI, so Fred, Doris and our son, Larry, who live with us, and they brought a lot of joy to our house, but they also brought the FBI to our house. So we had an FBI house, car outside of our house all the time. And they went to our neighbors and said what terrible people we were. And our neighbors loved my mom. They didn't agree with her, but my mom was a great, she had a communist heart. She was a good neighbor and she was a good human. Anyway, as a result of the FBI harassment, eventually we got evicted from our house. My mom lost her job. We had to move to another, uh, to another neighborhood, which actually was a good neighborhood for me because uh, I went to Lawndale, went to Penn on 15th and Neighbors. And it was only half day, so I got to play baseball in half the time with one of the three kids there. So, yeah, we lost. Uh, I mean, I, for years, I, I missed those years with my dad. He tried to make it up, but the Communist Party treated us kids. We were the Smith Act kids. They'd have parties. They, uh, the Sylvia Woods that I mentioned, her house was like another house for us. She was our, my, our other mother. So we paid a price, but compared to a lot of people, like people who were in United Electrical Workers Union, those unions were smashed, taken over by the IU, IUE, IBEW. There is still a UE. The best of what is of the union movement nowadays. So the McCarthy period was not just against communists, but you mean against communist led unions and against working class militancy, because the ones who fought the hardest were led by communists and anarchists and socialists, but especially communists. Okay, Fred, we have another question. Go ahead, Adam. Uh, hello, Fred. Um, I am uh, an ex-Marxist and married to a red diaper baby, but not a red diaper baby myself. Uh, I wanted to ask you, following up on one of the questions from earlier, uh, what about the Euro-communist movement or moment, the West European parties 
uh, largely after I think some kind of invasion of Czechoslovakia and under Brezhnev turning against the Soviet system uh, well ahead of the, the fall of the Eastern Bloc. And then you had mentioned the Red Guards earlier. Uh, after a few years of cultural revolution, there's plenty of conflict there with the turn against the Red Guards uh, and you know their supporters and later the, the Gang of Four uh, after Mao's death. So if you could comment on those two things, please. Thank you. All right. All right. Let's do the Red Guards first. Okay, Fred, make it quick because you got a few more questions. All right, I'll try to make my answer shorter. The Red Guards, there was a there was a power struggle in the Communist Party. There was Hu Xiaoxi, there was Zhou Enlai, there was Mao Zedong. And these were leaders who led the long march all the way from um, southern China into Yunnan to fight the Chinese, I mean, the Japanese. And meanwhile, I had to fight Chiang Kai-shek and the warlords, and a third to half of them died on that long march, heroes. And that kind of hero heroism was among many, many Chinese communists. And led the inspiration for the guards there were Red Guards who were basically wanted to support Mao and, and, and the struggle. And then there were Red Guards who realized that Mao was not the same guy. This guy who was having pictures of him swimming miles and miles of the Yangtze River was not how you were going to build communism. You're going to build communism from working class people and peasants are workers who work on the land take over and not rely on this cult of personality, etc. So the left of the Red Guard was smashed by the gang of poor and then the people who came after them. That's a short history. You can go read some of their articles at plp.org some of their articles are there and some of the analysis okay just so on world communism and about what happened in, in uh europe first of all the country i know the most about is the ddr the east german and they were never a socialist state a communist state in, uh, and they actually merged with the Socialist Party in Germany. And people like Bertolt Brecht, um, many others okay. flocked to East Germany. And they actually killed Nazis and hung them rather than the West Germans who had the rat lines okay. for them. And then the euro, for me, the mistake, the mistake of euro communism is they didn't go for communism. They went for a hybrid. And so there was really never what I would call a working class dictatorship, which is necessary to keep all the fascists and racists who are left there. Okay, Fred, we're going to have to ask you to, uh, all right, uh, Justin, you've got a question, I'm going to go to Elaine, so go ahead, go ahead and fire away, Justin. So, is it, if, if there's a strike, and there are uh, people who are going to break the strike and work, is violence justified against those people? All right, so... Um... When my dad was a UE organizer, he uh, told me a lot of stories. My dad told great stories. Um, and he told me uh, there was an education committee. 
So there's a famous poem, poem I think it's by Joe Hill, about a scab, what a scab is. I forget who it is. And it talks about, it could be from, uh, I forget who wrote, the lowest form of humanity. Somebody in IWW wrote it. Um, so uh, what would happen is the bosses would say, all right, they'd find somebody and say, hey, come, we'll pay you 50 cents more, dollar more, or somebody would say, my kids are sick. And they would say, or they would just say, yeah, I, I want to make more money. I don't give a shit about you, uh, whatever, or I'm going to get promoted or whatever. And the strikers would go and say, look, you know, our families are hurting. Our kids are not eating and you're stealing bread from us. And they would basically say, fuck you. I don't care. So the education committee would go and say, look, you know, you're really not doing you're cutting everybody's throat just to feather your own nest. You're just being as tough as asshole. Well, some people won't listen to reason. So the education committee would visit them. And after a baseball bat was either threatened or used, a lot of those scabs got educated. And they realized you cannot cross a picket line. You cannot steal from your brothers and sisters. Yes. Okay. In capitalism, violence is always on the table. You don't use violence when you're outnumbered. You use um, nonviolence in the civil rights movement at different times, but there were always guns in the civil rights movement. And, and, they, and every strike with public steel there was a massacre of strikers by the republic bosses every strike of this congress of industrial organization workers died and coal miners won what they won because they had guns and they defended themselves in hardon county and elsewhere Okay. Uh, so, uh, short answer is yes. Violence. Okay, this will be our last question. Elaine, if you've got your hand up, go ahead and ask. Uh, yes, uh, you mentioned work against the, against the Klan uh, quite a bit, a few times in your career. Um, how do you see the current state, the racial relations in the country improving? Thank you. Well, there's two things happening. There's a vast increase of racism. I mean, the number and the number of black and brown people incarcerated is greater than it's ever been. And it started with Obama, by the way. And there's mass deportation, etc. But there's a, a huge well of anti-racism and anger against racism. When you say, I'm at, I'm at uh, Amazon Fresh and the sign outside says, racism is not allowed. 10 years ago, you would not have seen that sign. Does that mean there isn't racism in Whittier? There's plenty of racism in Whittier. But working class people young working class people especially and a lot of young white working class people say no to racism say yes to multiracial unity say yes we will fight the cops the cops i was i was at a bar um and we were talking about what we hate with the bartender black guy around 40 45 and when i was talking about who i hate I like i hate jerry reinstar what he did to the White Sox and what he did to the Bulls, you know, whatever. He said, you know, Fred, who do we hate the most? Cops. Because in his life, as a black man, what was his experience? Racist cops. And they, people know that racism, you're not going to have a life 
until you have multiracial unity, till we treat people equally. Meanwhile, the Klan and the Nazis, half the cops in Chicago are probably in the Klan or Nazis. I'm sure a town like Huntington Beach in California, it's riddled with Klansmen. And they have rallies. So we need to have a mass movement against racism, sexism, attack against gays and lesbians, transgender, all of that. We need to build a movement that's getting stronger, but still is small. We need to be not thousands, but millions and work our guts out to do that, to build a base for anti-racist working class ideas and action. Because nobody's going to change the world but us. No fucking politician. They just voted in Karen Bass. She's the same shit. The guy that you just voted in Chicago is going to be the same shit to us. I guarantee you, the lives of the working class is in their own hands. Okay. No more questions. Uh, David's going to start the rebuttals. Any questions? We uh, can currently we got to be out of here in about a half an hour because of a baby shower in the restaurant. So we're going to start rebuttals. We're going to give everybody about three minutes. Uh, go ahead, Dave, and then let's go in. All right. First of all, the AFL CIO did not get to start at the end of the 19th century. It was just the AFL. I have a question. The CIO if I may. started in the 1930s. And the merge to the AFL CIO, that merger didn't take place until 1955. So the public steel strike that took place in 19, on Memorial Day weekend in 1937. And people were, at first, were picketing outside peacefully. There was even, there was even a vendor there selling nickel and brick ice cream. And then the police moved in at the urging of the public steel officers, uh, corporate officers, and they punched in the end, beating up people. And when somebody protested, what about our rights? Question. Questions. No questions. I it's have questions. It's now rebuttal time, Lana. I'm not I'm not talking about rebuttal. You understand? I'm talking about question. And we're talking about rebuttals. And when the, when the cop beat up some guy, he protested, said, what about our rights? response was, you red bastards, you ain't got no legal rights. And my answer is, the hell the guy doesn't. So it was one of the most bloody union demonstrations in history. And it kind of pissed off the Roosevelt administration too. I also have a question. Can I ask him now or no? No, no, Lana, we were, you should have asked earlier before we closed him out. All right, go ahead. Really? No, Mike, very quick question, yeah. very important. Are you, she going to ask or am I going to go? Uh, Lana, ask a quick question. Okay, very quick. So I'm from Russia, right? So my question is, what the difference between socialism uh it was not communism in russia yeah because they're screaming oh uh, forward to communism forward to communism but we never really uh, feel like communism but socialism all right my question is what the difference between socialism in eastern europe and here in states what the right, right, hold off on your answer till you till the end when we finish the rebuttals what the difference and what the the uh, hey, Anna, you had your question similar. Okay, I want to answer. Okay, thank you. Bye. Fred will, Fred will get it at this at the end of the session. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, basically, I found the talk interesting. Uh, we learned a few new things about the history involved. But my view on this whole thing of communism versus socialism versus free market is very simply this. All of us as individuals and all nations are really amalgams or combinations. There are very few individuals who are totally communist in their views or totally socialist. 
or relatively few, most of us subscribe to some aspects of each of those philosophies. And nations do the same thing. Uh, we call the Russians communists or the, the Soviets communists, but no, they were socialists. The Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And China is, is was more toward communism. Now they're moving more toward free market. The only true communist society, they're relatively few. Somebody mentioned Native American. Uh, that's probably true. And a lot of tribal peoples in other parts of the world is probably pretty much common ownership of everything. Uh, the relative, and the kibbutzes in Israel were probably pretty close to pure communists and maybe some of the uh, religious, the uh, friends, Quakers and Tel Aviv are fairly close to communism. Um, and as far as And uh, so as far as that goes, there are relatively few of those. The, uh, the Soviet Union was pretty much socialist in some governments today. Vietnam is maybe fairly or closer to communism and socialism. But generally speaking, uh, most are amalgam. We're an amalgam here in the United States. We're partially uh, free market, largely free market, but some socialism. And then we've got our libraries, our schools, our roads, our police, our fire, etc., are all collective uh, organizations owned, owned and operated by one form of government or, or another. So we're all uh, combinations. When I try and evaluate what's what, uh, the thing I like to look at on the internet is the percentage of GDP, which is governmentally controlled in every, any given country, privately controlled. Of course, in a communist society, almost all would be controlled by the government. In a strong, more socialist country, uh, a larger portion would be. Uh, and in Western Europe, the United States, Japan, and so forth, we're amalgams, and the percentages seem to vary from like 28 to 35, 36 uh, percent uh, of the government is controlled by the or of the GDP. In other words, the financial transactions are controlled by the government. And the U.S. is not at the very bottom, not the least um, socialist. Uh, there are other countries that are less socialist. I think believe Japan is less socialist than we are. And, and certain other countries. So uh, that's the way we have to look at it. It's really a blend. We're always there's always a blend there. We can all learn from uh, some things. Inside. Thank you. All right. Who's next? Who is next? Okay. I'm gonna go next. Then. You want to go? Okay, Sid. Go ahead. Sid, you want to go? All right, just, just turn your chair halfway. I'll get your microphone. Okay, stay right there. I'll get you the mic. Speak loud and we'll be all set. Ted, please speak into the microphone. All Make right. it closer. What is the talking about? Some well, sir. Some countries are a little mixed. But you have to work. That is bad. Therefore, it's a history of the country. For instance, Germany, before the 1880s, the borrow market was, was living in England at that particular time. But there was the Communist Party, and it was called Social Democrats. And every time they had an election, they got more and more votes. Please use the microphone, Ted. Please use the microphone. Closer. Don't be afraid of it. Louder, Ted. Transformed Germany at that time in the 1880s. Notice that and said, We have to change. We'll call ourselves social democrats, but the communists. 
and will make the fuel form. And the fuel form only came into being because people were against capital. So he made a, he was a social democrat, but he was. He was trying to protect capitalists. And he enacted these reforms. It's the same thing that happened in the United States during the Roosevelt administration. Something like 100,000 communists in the United States before the Second World War. the microphone please please use the microphone i can barely hear you speak into it don't be afraid of it just talk into that microphone said you're, you're not bring it closer in Russia, the communist party was the only had about 14 people that belong to it. In the United States, it was about 100,000. 100, That's why he brought in the reform, the New Deal. He only done it because of the workers were learning that capitalism didn't work. So he tried to do reform. All right, who's next on the way bottles? Let's get going here. Okay, where's my uh, where's uh, where's answer to my question? The usual here. Uh, since I spoke a little bit earlier, I'll try and keep it quick. Uh, I think our discussion tonight, at least of the heat market era, was very interesting. I, I think the um, a little hard to hear some of what Sid said, but the these ruptures in the communist movement also happen for a reason. Ruptures between uh, reformists and revolutionary wings, or especially in places that have, where communist parties have gained power, political power, rifts with, uh, within those, and where people are genuinely dissatisfied with some of what they've seen. Uh, in the United States, I am guessing our speaker, if he said he supported Progressive Labor Party, is no stranger to this. Also, at the end of the Cold War, the CPUSA split uh, with the uh, Committees of Correspondence for Democracy and Socialism. The West European parties that I mentioned earlier had this problem where between 1968 and the fall of the Soviet Union, they really started to lose faith and look for something different. I know you answered that some. I mentioned the, uh, the problems in China. Uh, and. Chinese Communist Party has gone in a very different direction since the height of the Cultural Revolution. Uh, also, the little Maoist insurgencies around the world that have been a disaster. And I think that all this since then, uh, since the 70s, like the Shining Path in Peru or uh, some of those in the uh, border regions or re regional insurgencies in South Asia and India, or they have to retreat from it once they are in power, like in Nepal. They can't go through with the sort of textbook Maoist program exactly. Anyway, these dilemmas I think will keep happening because it's inherent in how humans get into conflict with one another and how idealistic schemes tend to not work out. Every bit as much as it is also going to keep happening that uh, you know people with wealth and power will get the state and the police to abuse authority for them. Uh, just like they did back in the 1880s here in town against the German workers. Now, with that funky Latin backbeat, I'm going to say, 
Thank you very much and pass it to the next comment. Okay, go ahead. Mr. Kushner, can you answer to my question? Yes or no? No, be quiet. No, you be quiet. Ruth. Amunyaka. Okay. I need answer from Mr. Kushner to Pam, be quiet. Okay, well, I just want to leave you with one idea. There's a song called A Change Gonna Come. It's my favorite song. By a legendary singer called Sam Cooke. And that's my credo. My credo, or whatever. We have two alternatives. We can continue living under capitalism, which is the de definition of, of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and think you're going to get different results. Capitalism brings misery, okay. racism, sexism, climate change. Or we can have a system where workers run things, which is what made a mimic me. 
that we take power, that we as a class make a new world, a change. Death to imperialism, death to the king of England, death to the imperialists, to the blood diamonds, to the rape of Africa, to the millions of kids who die from disease and malnutrition, while others have houses and have parties that cost millions. They, people like Jeff Bezos give away with one hand and they take away with five. They produce nothing. Our class produces everything. Today we are not in the okay. of, the, of the international, which is not quite true. One day we will be all. Happy May Day. Thank you for this opportunity. Thanks, bud. All right, shut, go ahead, David, shut us down. Thank you all for coming. Um, yeah.